hope you have your Bible with you. We're going to open to Revelation chapter 5, Revelation 5 today. Well, I got to ask you a couple questions uh, this morning. Have you ever been to 11 11 Burgers? Anybody? Anybody? Oh, a lot of you. Okay. Good burgers, right? Good, big, juicy burgers. Yes, it's more expensive than fast food, but worth the money, I think. Yeah, it's, it's me. Let me ask you another question. Have you ever seen Toy Story 4? Anybody seen Toy Story 4? Okay, nobody? All right. No, a couple of, couple of us here. I'm a real softie for Pixar. I really am. I mean, like, oh, I, I watched it recently with my daughter, my youngest daughter, and I laughed and I cried. <laughs> but it's worth your time. Now, it was my birthday earlier this week. A lot of you know that. And we had my wife made peanut butter pie. All right. It was worth the calories. <laughs> right? We often measure the worth of things. Another way to say it, we would say we measure the worthiness of things. Right? Is this music worthy of my learning it? The work that it takes to learn this song. Is this person Worth my trust? Is this person worthy of my trust? Is this sermon going to be worth listening to? Some of you are wondering. No, I hope not. <laughs> Is this a worthy message, right? So today we're going to talk about and we're going to see the one who is worthy of all our adoration, time, sacrifices, allegiance, and praise. And a spoiler alert, it's Jesus. In case you were wondering, it's Jesus. So I hope you have your Bible open to Revelation 5. Revelation chapter 5. This will be the last sermon in Revelation for 2020. Thank you, finally. I was waiting for that, someone to be sad. Uh, we're going to pick it back up in Revelation chapter 6. And if you know Revelation, that's when the judgments start to hit. So judgment's coming in 2021. You heard it here first. <laughs> Judgment is coming in 2021. We're going to look at it in January, but you'll have to wait for it. Today is the last one in Revelation. So what's the point of the text today? I'll give it to you in three words. Jesus is worthy. That's the point of the text. Jesus is worthy. This is the throne room scene continued from chapter 4. If you were here last week, I hope you were, or you, you were able to watch online. Uh, Revelation 4, we see this throne room scene of God seated on his throne. And now this is a continuation. It's not like this is a new scene. This is the same scene. It's just continued now in chapter 5. There's three parts to this text in Revelation 5. Here's the first part. The problem the problem. No one is worthy. What does that mean? Let's look at it. No one is worthy. Starting in verse 1. Look at verse 1. Then I saw in the right hand of God, or the one seated on the throne, that's God the Father, a scroll with writing on both sides, sealed with seven seals. God the Father is seated on the throne. We saw that really clearly last week in Revelation 4. But we see something different now. We see he's holding something in his right hand. What is it? Anybody notice what it was? Help me out here. A scroll, right? A scroll. A scroll with writing on both sides, sealed with seven seals. Now, what is this scroll? What, what does it say? That's the big question. Scholars actually point back to a double-sided scroll found in Ezekiel, in the Old Testament book of Ezekiel, chapter 2. And this is what Ezekiel says. So I looked and saw a hand reaching out to me, and there was a written scroll in it. When he unrolled it before me, it was written on the front and back. Words of lamentation, mourning, and woe were written on it. So now we get a little hint of what could be on this scroll in Revelation chapter 5. Lamentation, mourning, woe are coming for the wicked. And we'll see that unfold in January. Judgment for the wicked and vindication for the righteous. This scroll 
describes how the end will play out. Listen to what Robert Mounts says. He says, this scroll contains the full account of what God in his sovereign will has determined as the destiny of the world. This is how the end will play out. Now let's look at how John sees something else in verse 2. Look at verse 2. I also saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or even to look in it. The difference between this text and Ezekiel 2 is in Ezekiel 2, God opens the scroll. But now a mighty angel proclaims what? Who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? And what's the answer? No one. No one's worthy. Verse 3 makes that really clear, doesn't it? No one in heaven, on earth, or under the earth. No one. No one in all creation is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals. One scholar, Grant Osborne, tells us this is not so much a moral or spiritual worthiness, but an inherent an inherent in, uh, sufficiency. So, in other words, no one is sufficient. No one is sufficient to open the scroll and to break its seals. John, who's writing this, he feels that the scroll will never be opened. And that means the judgment of God will not happen until the scroll is opened. Vindication, in other words, vindication will not happen for God's people. Judgment will not come. The end will not come. That's what John is feeling. That's how he responds in verse 4. Look at verse 4. Look how he responds. He says, I wept and wept because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or even look in it. Now, this is not just a couple of tears, you know, a couple of tears down his face, the way we all cry for Hallmark movies. Oh, God. No, John is in utter dismay. This is not just a couple of tears. This is, this is unrestrained weeping. It's an ugly cry. This is the way that Jesus actually, it's the same word, that Jesus wept over Jerusalem on the day of Palm Sunday. And he wept over Jerusalem, longed for them to repent. It's a grieving so John is in utter dismay because it feels that God's plans have been thwarted because no one is worthy. Maybe you have this feeling today. You look at the world and you feel dismay. You feel lost. You are grieving and you wonder, has God's plans been thwarted? Have God's plans been thwarted? And the answer is, what is the answer? No. No. God's plans have not been thwarted. And there's, they haven't been thwarted in Revelation 5 either. And there is hope. So that's next. Part two here in this text. The solution. Jesus is worthy. The solution. Jesus is worthy. Look at verse 5. Then one of the elders said to me, do not weep. Look, the lion from the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered so that he is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. This lion from the tribe of Judah is a fulfillment of Genesis 49, verses 9 and 10. The root of Jesse comes from Isaiah 11, verse 1. Now, a shoot that is described in Isaiah 11, when a shoot will come from the stump of Jesse. Now, let me just show you a picture of this. Okay, so this is when I, when I was in Israel, I took a picture of this because you see sort of the tree, and then I know it's really bad handwriting, but I labeled it the shoot, okay? You see on the left, that's the shoot, and it comes out of the tree. So when we were going, th walking, this is in uh, Jerusalem. We're walking through, and our, our guide said, hey, this is a shoot, and this is what the shoot looks like coming out of the stump. That's a fulfillment of Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1. So Jesus is that shoot. He is coming out and giving life to all. And so these are messianic titles 
the lion of the tribe of Judah, the shoot from the stump of Jesse. He is in the line of David. That means Jesus is the ideal king. Now notice, Jesus has conquered. You see that in verse five? Jesus has conquered. This is what Jesus has been urging the churches to do in chapters two and three. He says, for the conqueror, and here's the promise, this is what he wants the church to do, is to conquer. And how did Jesus conquer? We'll see that in verse six. Look at verse six. Then I saw one like a slaughtered lamb standing in the midst of the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders. Now this is a paradox. How did Jesus conquer? By being slaughtered. That doesn't seem like conquering to me. That seems like being conquered. If you're slaughtered, you've lost. You've been conquered. But that's not the case with Jesus. James Hamilton puts it this way. He says, Jesus conquered by getting killed. It is the greatest paradox in the world. The Almighty King overcame all his enemies as his enemies seemingly overcame him. And this is well described in Colossians chapter 2, verses 14 and 15. Listen to this. He erased the certificate of death, of debt with its obligations that was against us and opposed to us and has taken it away by what? Nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and disgraced them publicly. He triumphed over them in him. How? At the cross. Grant Osborne says, here lies the greatest paradox of Christianity. Victory comes from apparent defeat. Evil is conquered through the terrible sacrificial suffering of the cross. So think about it this way. The very moment Satan thought he had won was the moment he lost. This is amazing. There's a progression here even in this text in Revelation 5. You see the images of Jesus. We see the pictures of Jesus. He is the lion, remember? He is the lion who became a lamb that became the slaughtered lamb. The lion became a lamb that became the slaughtered lamb. Now, that is one of the key themes in the book of Revelation. We'll come back to it again and again. Jesus as the slaughtered lamb who is victorious. Victory comes through defeat, and that is countercultural. But it is true. <laughs> the slaughtered lamb points back actually to the Old Testament. In Exodus, remember, the last of the ten plagues was the death of the firstborn. And what did the Israelites have to do? They had to slaughter a lamb in their home and they had to spread his blood over what? The doorpost. So that the angel of death would what? Pass over those homes where the blood was on the doorpost so that the firstborn was saved in that home. The lamb died instead of the firstborn. And then, of course, the lambs throughout the sacrificial system of the temple in the Old Testament that never really truly covered the sins of the people, but they were doing it again and again. These lambs were slaughtered again and again. And then John the Baptist shows up in the New Testament and he looks and he sees Jesus and he says what? Look, he says, the lamb of God, the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Think of that. Jesus is the ultimate lamb, the lamb to end all lambs. So how did he take away the sin of the world? By his own death on the cross. Jesus said himself in John 10, verse 11, he said, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. So the shepherd became a sheep, a lamb that was slaughtered. When Jesus died on the cross, his blood, think about this, Jesus died on the cross, his blood was also spread over posts of wood to cover our sins so that God would pass over us, that Jesus died instead of me. Only a perfect substitute could satisfy the justice of God. God is infinitely holy and will not allow sinful people rebellious people to dwell with him. He is just, he is righteous. Hebrews 9 says, according to the law, almost everything is purified with blood and without the shedding of blood, there is what? No forgiveness. 
A few verses later, it says this, Jesus did not do this to offer himself many times as the high priest enters the sanctuary yearly with the blood of another. Otherwise, he would have had to suffer many times since the foundation of the world. But now, he has appeared one time at the end of the age for the removal of sin by the sacrifice of himself. You see that? Jesus died for you, for me, to reconcile us to God. He died to offer us the opportunity to be redeemed, to be forgiven, to be saved. This is the good news. This is the gospel. So have you responded to this good news? How do you respond? You respond by repenting of your sin, turning away from your sin, and believing alone on Jesus. Have you made that decision? Have you turned to Christ? I hope you have. And if you haven't, you can do it right now. Turn to him. Believe on him. He died for you so you could be forgiven and set free. Let's look at the rest of verse 6. This is, again, looking at Jesus now. This is Jesus. He had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent into all the earth. Seven horns and seven eyes. Really? Literally? I don't think so. Seven is the number of perfection, completion. Seven horns, seven eyes. Now, the seven eyes, the seven is already defined for us in verse 6, are the seven spirits of God sent into all the earth. This is the presence of the Holy Spirit. But what about the seven horns? Well, seven horns are a picture of conquering and often thought of as a ram. So here's how it goes. Here's the progression. Jesus is the lion who became a lamb, who became the slaughtered lamb, who became the conquering ram. That's what we're seeing here. We're seeing sort of a picture of Jesus in all of his glory. The lion who became the lamb, who became the slaughter lamb, who became the conquering ram. That's the seven horns. Jesus is the perfectly seeing, perfectly powerful, conquering ram. It's why Philippians 2 says, at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow. He's a conquering ram. And every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is, is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The conquering Jesus takes action in verses 7 and 8. Look at verses 7 and 8. He went and took the scroll out of the right hand of the one seated on the throne. That's just all he did. Took it. No problem. No questions. He took it. He's worthy. Look at verse 8. When he took the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb. Each one had a harp and golden bowls filled with incense, which are the prayers of the saints. So no one in the throne room says this, but we will. Jesus is worthy. Jesus is worthy. He took the scroll from God the Father and the four living creatures and 24 elders, what did they do? How'd they respond? They fell down. They fell down and worshiped. What were they holding? Help me out here. What were they holding? What does it say? Harps. Okay, that's where we get the picture of like harps in heaven. Okay, the harp was often an instrument used in the Psalms for worship. That's what it means. They're worshiping Christ. And then these golden bowls filled with incense. That's kind of interesting. What is that? We don't, we don't know until the text tells us, right? What are, the, what's, what are the golden bowls filled with incense? What are those? The prayers of the saints. Wait a minute. <laughs> Wait a minute. Our prayers matter? Sometimes we don't think they do. We just think, well, I guess I can pray. No, our prayers are being collected in bowls. Think about it in that way. Our prayers really matter. Are we praying? Are we praying these days? I, I know we are. I, I, but how can we pray more? Oftentimes, I think prayer becomes sort of a last resort. Like when things go really bad, okay, now we need, really need to pray. Uh, I think we need to make it our first impulse to pray. We need to be steadfast in prayer, being watchful and thankful, it says in Colossians 4. So how can I grow in prayer? How can I grow in my praying life? I'll give you three ways. Just this is very, very quick. Number one, 
How can we grow in our prayers? Number one, be aware that we are in a spiritual battle. Did you know? Did you know we're in a spiritual battle? Do we, are we aware of that every day? We should be. It will help us pray. Listen to 1 Peter 5, 8. It says, be sober-minded, be alert. Your adversary, the devil, is prowling around like a roaring lion looking for anyone he can devour. We need to be aware of Satan's schemes. But we can have confidence because we have a lion too. The lion of Judah, who is infinitely more powerful than Satan. So we don't have to be afraid, but we need to be aware of what Satan is trying to do. But we can trust Jesus. And we need to be aware that we're in a spiritual battle. That's the first way we can grow in our prayer. Be aware we're in a spiritual battle. Second, we need to recognize our insufficiency. We need to recognize our insufficiency. When we admit our own insufficiency, we will be pushed to pray. We'll be pushed to our knees. Psalm 42 describes our need for God. It says, as a deer longs for flowing streams, so I long for you, God. I thirst for God, the living God. But our culture pushes us in the other direction. You can do it. You got this. Books like Girl, Stop Apologizing by Rachel Hollis feed a self-sufficiency that makes us, like the church at Laodicea, sickening to Christ. We need to repent of our self-sufficiency and recognize our absolute insufficiency. And that will draw us to pray. So how can we grow in our prayer? Be aware we are in a spiritual battle. Recognize our insufficiency. Third, trust the Lord with all our hearts. Not part of our hearts, all of our hearts. What does it say in Proverbs 3, 5, and 6? Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will make your paths straight or clear. So do we really lean on the Lord, or do we lean on our own understanding? A trusting heart is a prayerful heart. I love Pastor Mark's uh, challenge to the students this year. One of his challenges is for them to develop a prayer calendar. So you write, the idea is you write down one person you pray for for every day of the month. And you contact that person. You say, how can I pray for you? How can I be praying? And then they respond back. You can text a prayer. You can call them. You can see them face to face and pray for them. Maybe that's something you can do. You can add that. It's something I've been trying to do. Now, I, there's days I forget. There's days that I miss it. But I often try to reach out to different people. How can I pray for you today? And then sometimes they reciprocate. How can I pray for you? And we just, as a church, it's a very simple step. But we can be praying so much more if we just do something as simple as a prayer calendar. So I challenge you to do that. There's a lot to pray about these days, right? Wouldn't you say? <laughs> Why don't we just pray right now? Let me just pause. The sermon's not over. Oh, ah, what? <laughs> let, me, let me pray right now. We'll, let's pray for our world, our nation, our community. There's so much to pray for. Let's just pray right now. Lord God, we come to you today. We just pause. We thank you that you hear our prayers, that our prayers matter that our prayers move. We don't know how. It's a mystery, but we know you're sovereign, yet you hear our prayers and you act upon our prayers. So we pray right now, Lord, that you would do a work in our community. There's a lot of hospital workers that are really discouraged on the brink of breaking. I think about the virus and all the effects widespread the psychological impact, the, the fear, the anxiety that it's causing, the loss of so much. And so, God, we ask for your help. We even pray for our political season that we're in, which is extremely polarized and divisive, and we don't know what is true. We look at the media, we look at the news, we cannot even trust what they're saying is true. But we know you are the God of all truth, and so we pray that you would bring the truth to light and that you would do what is right and best. And we pray that we would submit to you no matter what happens in the days and months, even the years to come. So we submit to you, God. We thank you that we can trust you because you are worthy of our trust, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
So Jesus is worthy. Jesus is worthy. And because Jesus is worthy, heaven does the only thing they should do. And it's what we should do. And that is, number three, worship Jesus. Worship Jesus. Look at verse 9 and verse 10. And they sang a new song. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slaughtered and you purchased people for God by your blood from every tribe and language and people and nation. You made them a kingdom and priests to our God and they will reign on the earth. So there's a lot there. I'll try to be brief with it. Jesus is worthy to take the scroll and open its seals because why? Because Jesus was slaughtered on the cross. That's a historical fact. It has happened. Again, he conquers by being slaughtered. And what's the result of that? Number two, Jesus purchased people from every tribe and nation. Purchased people from every tribe and nation, which is, this word purchased is uh, a metaphor used for the freeing of a prisoner of war from bondage. That's what that means, purchased. Set us free. We are freed and now, We belong to God in order to do his will, to serve him. And the third reason that Jesus is worthy to take the scroll is that he made his people a kingdom and priests. This is God's promise to Israel in Exodus 19, verse 6. It's coming to fulfillment in the church. It means all Christians will reign with Christ while serving God for eternity. It's a great picture. So what's the application here? Very simple. Jesus' victory is our victory. If we're in Christ, Jesus' victory is our victory. We should not walk around with our heads slumped over thinking we've lost and we are being defeated. Quite the contrary. We will reign on earth for eternity with Christ if we persevere, if we continue on. And Jesus has promised victory to us. We've already won. We're not waiting to see if we've won. We've already won because Christ died and he rose again. Now look at verse 11. Verse 11. Then I looked and heard the voices of, or the voice of many angels around the throne and also of the living creatures and of the elders. We saw them in chapter 4. Their number was countless thousands plus thousands of thousands. So the choir is growing rapidly. <laughs> How many? How many are there? Countless thousands plus thousands of thousands. Don't get out your calculator. Okay, I know you want to, some of you. This is just a way of expressing an innumerable number, more than anyone could count. It's not the point. You don't count them. They're innumerable. And what are they doing? Verse 12. Verse 12. They said with a loud voice, Worthy is the lamb who was slaughtered to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. Now, I want to believe they didn't just say it. I want to, I, I, I think they sang it. I think they should sing it. And I, I say that because this is in Handel's Messiah, which is an amazing work of music. If you haven't heard it, this is a great time of year to find it and listen to it. A lot of revelation is in Handel's Messiah. And I sang Handel's Messiah with my friend Aaron Bauer, who was up here a minute ago. We sang it uh, together at Moody. So whether they said it or sang it, listen to the truth. Here it is. Jesus is worthy. Jesus is worthy. Worthy of what? Well, they say, verse 12, power, riches, wisdom, strength, honor, glory, blessing. How many is that? Seven. Interesting. Completion, perfection. Now, here are some personal questions I want to ask us here. Jesus is worthy of my power. Am I submitting to him? Jesus is worthy of my riches. Am I generous toward him? Jesus is wise. Do I listen to him? Jesus is worthy of my strength. Am I using it for him? Jesus is worthy of my honor. Am I honoring him with my life? Jesus is worthy of glory. Do I glorify him? Jesus is worthy of blessing. Am I worshiping him? 
We have to ask ourselves these questions. And what we give our time, money, thoughts, and energy to most is what we consider most worthy. Think about it that way. Here's another way to think about it. Our actions and thoughts reveal whom or what we believe is most worthy. So what do we give our time, money, thoughts, and energy to? What do you find yourself thinking about when you have a moment? Is it the Packers? <laughs> is, it, is it investments? Is it politics? Is it physical health? Even family? Now, it's not wrong to think about these things or to give time, energy, even money to these things, but could you survive without them. I think this COVID, COVID-19, the shutdowns and the restrictions have really tested this, tested us. But we need to know this. We need to believe it. Jesus alone is worthy. Jesus alone is worthy. If I lose everything, but I have Jesus, I have enough. So what changes do we have to make to give him our best? The worship of Jesus expands in verses 13 and 14. Look at verses 13 and 14. I heard every creature in heaven, on earth, under the earth, on the sea, and everything in them say, blessing and honor and glory and power be to the one seated on the throne and to the lamb forever. And ever the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshiped. So now it's, notice, every creature in the cosmos. Commentator Robert Mount says, The universality of Christ's great redemptive work calls for a universal response. Blessing, honor, glory, power be to God the Father and to Jesus. Now, the ones closest to the throne affirm this by saying, amen. You see that? And the elders around the throne fall down again and worship. Why? Jesus is worthy. So how does that make a difference in my life today? How does it make a difference? Good question. <laughs> because Jesus is worthy he can take the scroll and open it so God's plan for the end unfolds. In other words, Jesus, listen, don't miss this. Jesus has taken control of the world's destiny. Jesus has taken control of the world's destiny. So as we look at our world in 2020, we may not feel like Jesus has control. We feel very much out of control. Cases Coronavirus cases continue to go up and skyrocket. We, we, some of us have, some of you have experienced the loss of loved ones this year. For some of us, we've lost our opportunity to be with family for Thanksgiving. There's a distrust in the election results and political nastiness, could we say? There's family turmoil over all of these issues. It's a mess. The list goes on and on. But we need to know. We need to know Jesus is in control. He is. Last week we saw God is on his throne and Jesus is on his throne. You notice that at the end? Notice end of verse 13. Blessed, blessing and honor and glory and power be to the one seated on the throne. That's God the Father. And, see this? And to the Lamb. He is God. Jesus is God, and he is worthy of our worship. Jesus, don't miss this, Jesus is in control of the way our lives will turn out. Jesus is in control of the way our children's lives will turn out. Jesus is in control of the way our nation will turn out. In the year 2000, James Montgomery Boyce, a renowned pastor and scholar, was diagnosed with terminal cancer. He died eight weeks later. 
Before he died, he addressed his congregation. He said this, if God does something in your life, would you change it? If you change it, you'd make it worse. It wouldn't be as good. So that's the way we want to accept it and move forward. And who knows what God will do. We keep saying, Jesus is worthy. That means he is worthy of my trust. Doesn't it come down to that these days in this world? Jesus is worthy of my trust. He will not let us down, not forever, not forever. We'll see in chapter 6, the martyrs under the throne saying, How long, O Lord? How long until you will vindicate us? And God says, just a little while longer. Just wait. Just a little while longer. Maybe that's where you are today. Don't stop trusting in Jesus. You may have to wait just a little, just a little while longer. Evil, listen, don't miss this. Evil will come to an end forever. Evil will come to an end. Why? Because Jesus is the conquering ram. Sickness will come to an end. Why? Because Jesus is the slaughtered lamb. By his wounds, we have been healed. 1 Peter 2. This broken world that we see all around us will one day be renewed. Jesus will make all things new. Why? Because Jesus, the Lion of Judah, lives. Jesus is worthy. Let's pray. Lord God, I pray you would take these truths we've seen today and plant them deep in our hearts. We need to be constantly reminded of this truth that Jesus is worthy. He is worthy of our trust. He is worthy of our adoration. He is worthy of our allegiance. He is worthy of all blessing and honor and glory and power. And so I pray that you would remind us of these truths day by day as we go through this week, as we go through this holiday season, which is different than other seasons that we can ever remember. I pray that we would remember that Jesus is worthy. And we pray this powerful name of your son. Amen.